Got a sound here in the monitors, Roy. Acts chapter number 28. I got it. She got it. Acts chapter number 28. Now, while you're turning there, don't forget. Now, a lot of special things this week. Visitation. This is a very important week. Sun, uh, Thursday morning, Thursday evening, and also uh, uh, our, our Wednesday night services and everything as always. We, it's, this ought to be a week. This ought to be a week when everything is turned into a, a, a visitation, calling, contacting people. What our normal activities are, just turn it into some kind of visitation and work for it toward next Sunday. So you can get people to come to church on a day like that that would never come no other way. And God will bless it. I've seen him do it many times. The Lord will bless it. And uh, we want you to do that. And then, um, uh, a lot of other things that you need to be praying about. Uh, pr uh, next Sunday night, we'll have Lord's Supper. Uh, we do on our anniversary always. And we will be having a baptism. If you've been saved and have not been baptized, come ready next Sunday evening for the service. And we'll have a meet and talk about that later. But... Um, I'm looking forward to next week. Don't forget to bring a meal. I have to get a picture took out here. We're going down to Eastside Baptist Church and having dinner. For those that want to come, just bring you a meal. And uh, we'll be furnishing the plates and cups and so forth. Just bring the food. Bring the food. And you can bring some uh, uh, two-liter drinks or something like that. And we're having uh, looking for a great time the Lord. All right, Acts chapter 28. Everybody listen now. This is the message I feel like the Lord's laid on my heart for tonight. Been, I've been studying on it up there in New York and uh, on the airplane today. Well, I was talking to this Jew on the airplane. He had one of them little things on his head. Because um, I figured he had a Hebrew Old Testament. And I began to talk to him and witness, try to witness to him a little bit. I first I offered him my seat. I said, you want my seat? Anything I can do for you? Uh, he was kind of standing up behind me. And I said, the Lord said, if I bless you, he'll bless me. And uh, so you can have my seat or anything. I'll, you know, go get you something to drink, whatever you... Uh, and he and he, he was real nice. He looked like a little roly-poly Santa Claus kind of guy. And uh, he, I told him, I said, that's a Hebrew Bible. I said, I didn't know if it was up... I said, let me see that. I was looking at it and I had it upside down. Didn't even know it. So they figured I didn't know Hebrew. I turned it over like that, you know, and started looking at it, and uh, I started witnessing, trying to witness to him. And I said, well, the only thing you need is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, there'll be room for all of us. And I said, well, you know, uh, read there in Isaiah. Isaiah tells you about him, and he went on this big long thing about how, you know, God was going to accept him. He was going to find out who's right, and I said, how strict the life they live. And I said, yeah, you're living a good Christian life. You just ain't a Christian. Can't be a Christian without Christ. You can't, I don't care how good you live, you're not a Christian unless the Lord Jesus Christ lives in your heart. He is your, he's the door. It's like you got on this door, get on this airplane, he's the door. You don't get in without him, through, without going through him. And uh, uh, I said, uh, he said, well, if we live this way, and I said, you probably live a better Christian life than most Christians. You just don't have Christ. And that's what, the, that's the truth tonight. You've got to have the Lord. You've got to have the Lord. A lot of people know about the Lord, but don't know the Lord. Amen. It's like they know about uh, President Lincoln, but they never met him. And it's a whole lot different when you meet him. Acts 28. They just had this bad shipwreck there in verse or the previous chapter. And we come to Acts 28, it said in verse 1, And when they were escaped, then they knew that the island was called Melita. And the barbarous people showed us no little kindness. It's real nice to them, barbarians. And they kindled a fire and received us every one because of the present rain and because of the cold. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand like a big uh, wicked poisonous snake and just buried them fangs right down in Paul's hand and hung on him. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, 
No doubt this man is a murderer. Though whom he hath escaped the, the sea, yet vengeance suffereth him suffereth not to live. Now that shows that even the heathen have a conscience of right and wrong. They know if you kill somebody that your life, you, you should forfeit your life. They got more sense than our senators and congressmen nowadays. There's something built into them that says, hey, you go out here and take an innocent person's life, you pay for it with your life. That's Old Testament, that's New Testament, that's all the way through. There's no such thing as believing the Bible without believing in capital punishment. Now, he said, they said, vengeance, don't suffer this guy to live. He must be a murderer. Verse 5, and he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. Howbeit, they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly. See, I don't know, it was one of them two-steppers he got bit by where you take two steps and drop dead. <laughs> I mean, that thing was, uh, that was like a cobra or something, brother, or them black mambas or something over there. But after they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. Now, I want to preach to you tonight. I want all, especially our young Christians, listen to me, and older ones too, on the subject, when the weather gets warm, the snakes start crawling. When the weather gets warm, the snakes start crawling. One good thing about wintertime is there ain't no snakes out. Hey, can't you say that's one good thing about the cold weather? No snakes. But just as sure as warm weather gets here in a few weeks, uh, eight, uh, several weeks from now, we're going to have some warm days. And after them warm days start coming around, you'll be going down the road home one evening and you'll say, there's a snake in the road. You'll first maybe see a little one about like this, and then you'll see a uh, mama snake, daddy snake, and maybe, and then you'll do it. If, you, if you're like me, if I'm going down a country road and I see a snake, buddy, I mean, I, I put on my brakes and try to slide over it. Don't just run over it. Just running over it ain't going to kill them. You've got to twist them in two. I stop and back up, you know, and then try to get my wheels right on them and, and, and do it like that on them. That's the way it is, especially on a dirt road. You've got to tie their guts out. You just run over them, they just mash and they just crawl right on out. But did you know when the weather starts getting warm like that, snakes start crawling? You say, well, what in the world has that got to do with us going to church, preacher? Spiritually speaking, another title of this message might be tonight, when God starts blessing, the devil always starts squirming. Another title of this message might be, when you get on fire for the Lord, the devil will attack you and try to stop you. When a church starts moving and starts, God starts swarming and the, the Lord's blessing, you can mark it down, the devil starts fighting. Do you know why some churches never have no trouble in them? Because it's wintertime there. God ain't even in the place and don't bless, and that's why everything runs so smooth. If you've got a church where God's blessing and moving, you're going to have chaos constantly because the devil just, them old snakes just started going like this, you know, and just start working and demons start working and you've got peace and joy and love of the Lord, but you've always got that work of the devil trying to stop you. Now, I couldn't tell you the churches that I've known of that started good and go good and then bust up. The Lord blesses. They grow. People start getting saved. And, and the Lord, a fire starts, just like it did here. And then a venomous beast comes out of that fire that got warmed up and messed it up. You know as well as I know that every time you really get on fire for God, every time you really get close to God and you think, buddy, I am ready now, you watch and see if the devil don't try to stop you. He'll do it. Now, we'll notice this a scriptural principle tonight throughout your Bible, so keep your Bible handy there. Let's look at it here in Matthew chapter 4, in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, sir, even the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here in Matthew chapter 4, we find when the Lord began His ministry here at 30 years of age. At 30 years of age, the Lord got down to business, so to speak, in the ministry that God allowed Him to come here and do. And the Lord went out and fasted 40 days and 40 nights. And um, if there is such a thing, He was more with His Father on that point than any other time. I know there were one, and, and He was always close to Him. I understand He's a perfect night. I know all of that. But you know what I mean? That's the beginning. That was the highlight of His life so far. Notice the Bible did not say the devil came to Jesus when he was 12. 
The Bible didn't say the devil came to Jesus when he was 24. The Bible didn't say the devil came to Jesus when he was 26 or 27, even though he lived a perfect life, never committed one sin. When did the devil come? The Bible said here in verse number 2, and when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward unhungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. That is the only time that you have him on earth and the actual devil addressing him face to face. The devil came to him after that 40-day fast. When he really started his ministry, when he really began, we see that principle that when he prayed and fasted to do great works for God, then came the devil. Not when he was 29, not when he was 27, but when he was 30 and beginning his ministry. You young men just starting out in the ministry, boy, you don't, you're going to catch it. When you really sell out to God, when you really get down here and say, praise God, I'm on fire. Some of these young boys that's on fire for the Lord, I can tell you right now what's going to happen. The devil is going to knock you up the side of your head. It's going to happen one way or the other. You can't eat. You will not get through it without it. You just might as well expect it. It's going to happen. He's going to try to knock you down. He's going to try everything. Don't think something strange is happening. Don't think, oh no, I was doing so good and now this happened. You just well get ready for it. It's going to happen. Something's going to happen to just knock you for a loop. Something's going to happen to try to take you back into your old life. Something's going to happen to discourage you tremendously. He came to the Lord there after that great fast. Let me show you another Bible uh, uh, scripture on this principle. Turn to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8, we see when the seed was sown. Luke chapter number 8. And let's look uh, a few verses here about verse number 9. When the sower went out to sow, and the Bible tells us here in Luke chapter number 8 and verse 9, they ask him, what might this parable be? And uh, the Lord told them there, he talked about how that uh, the, uh, the, the seed was sown. And in verse 11, he said, now the parable is this. The seed is the Word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear. As soon as they hear, what happens? Then cometh the devil. Then cometh the devil. When? When they heard the Word of God. When the devil comes? When that Word of God starts taking root in you. When you really start getting a hold of it. Then cometh the devil and taketh away the Word out of their hearts lest they should believe and be saved. Many people come right to the door, the threshold of salvation, hear the Word of God, get under conviction, but then walk out of the church and the devil steals that Word out of their heart. He's just like a bird, see? And he flies over. You ever seen them pigeons out there at McDonald's? Like them. And boy, you throw something out there, there it goes. You throw something out there, there it goes. Now listen, you know what I'm doing here tonight? I'm throwing out the seed. I'm throwing out the seed. Just as quick as I get through tonight, them birds are going to be swarming down on you trying to steal that word out of your heart. That's why I learned a long time ago. I heard a preacher say it many, many, many years ago. He said, when God gives you something out of His Word, get you a piece of paper and a pencil and write down what God gave you and stick it in your notebook. He said, because I found out a long time ago that the devil can steal that word out of your heart, but the devil can't chew paper. Paper. And he said, whatever you write down on your notes, you've got it. And the devil can't take it away from you. And did you know that's true? How many times have you been sitting listening to a preacher and saying, man, that's good, that's good. I'm going to remember that. I'm going to remember that. And before you get home, you're already saying, now what was it he said? I can't remember it to save my life. You know what? Because the devil comes to steal the Word of God out of your heart. My goodness, if I can remember everything I'd ever heard preach, good night. I mean, I mean, I've heard preaching for 21 years. I've listened to hundreds of tapes. I've been in hundreds and hundreds of revival meetings, camp meetings. And did you know what? The devil tries to make sure that you put out of your mind everything.
thing that you get from God. You know what he'll do after you're saved? He'll try to take you away from hearing the Word of God just as quick as he can. Now listen, I've been through this with a bunch of crowds. Right now, we've got a bunch of young people on fire for the Lord. Let me show you something tonight. If you are between... Uh, if you are between 12 and 21 in here tonight, if you are between 12 and 21, I want you to stand up. I want you to look around here tonight. I want you to look what a crowd of young people in here on Sunday night. Amen. I thank you. You, can, you may sit down. And I tell you what, I tell, listen, you know what's going to happen? I've been through this. With, we've seen a revival. We've seen revival here ever since camp last summer. God has done a work in our young people's life. We've seen these boys. You ever notice that Brother Sam was talking about the other day? He said, there's something I've always noticed about our church. He said, there's always a new crop springing up to take that other place. And I said, you're absolutely right. I remember years ago, back up down in the old building, when Brother Ricky Bullock and Brother Tony and all them guys, Lee Davis, some of them, they started moving out. I thought, oh Lord, we ain't got no young preachers no more. And then up popped another crew. And then, you know, a bunch more moved out gone on doing something for the Lord. Roy Lee's down yonder. Gene's down yonder. Dale's down there being his assistant. Oh, I think, oh Lord, and don't you look up here tonight. You can't stick a pen in between these fellas. I mean, they're crammed in here like sardines. God has always blessed our church with a bunch of young men that's on fire and I praise Him for it. I cry, bless His name for it and I give Him the glory. That's not something I cooked up. That ain't something I've done by my power. That's God moving in our church. I want to tell you young preachers something tonight. I want to tell you young people here something tonight. The devil ain't going to take this sitting down. He's going to do everything in his power to divide you, to make you get your feelings hurt, to make you mad at somebody, or to get you out of here. Yeah, you know, because I've seen him do it before. You know what will happen? You know what will happen? The devil will give you a job to keep you out of church. I couldn't tell you the young people I've seen that got on fire for God. They were so excited. And then they come in one day and say, Guess what, Brother Danny? I got a job and I'm going to have to miss every other Sunday now. And that's the end of it. They don't even go to church now. They don't even go to church now. You say, Well, Brother Danny, I thought this girl, I told you before, I thought this girl out the steakhouse one day. I was sliding my trays down them little pipes that they got in there and going down like this. And this girl said, Hey, uh, uh, Brother Danny. And I said, where you been? I ain't seen you in a long time. And she said, Oh, I'm having to work on Sunday. Like that was legitimate, you know. And I said, Why are you going to work? She said, Because i got to pay for my car. Yeah. And I said, Well, why do you have to have a car? She said, So I can get to work. <laughs> I said, What? Run that by me again, I says. You've got to work to pay for your car and you've got to have a car to get to work. Won't you just quit and you won't have to have a car? She said, no, I want my car. And if you're not careful, when you get about 17 years old, you'll start thinking all you need is a job, a job. Can I just drop something on you young people here tonight? Now, I don't think it's wrong for a young person to work, and if it's, you know, if it's right now. But can I just drop something on you? All you old people, back me up here, okay? Back me up. Can I just tell you young people something? When you listen to me, believe me, kids, believe me. You are going to have all the chance you want to work one of these days. You're going to get to work all you want to work. You're going to work till you're sick of work. You're going to, you can see his work. For heaven's sake, why you got a chance? Stay home and stay in church. Let my daddy pay the bill. Wouldn't you agree with that, parents? Ain't they going to get their share of it? I'm not saying it's wrong for them to work. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying it's, I'm, I'm not saying it's a sin or anything like that. But believe me, kids, you're going to get to work from the time you're 20 to you're 30 and the time you're 30 to you're 40 and the time you're 40 to you're 50. You want, mark my words, some of you kids right here ain't careful. First thing you know, you're all fired up right now. You can't even wait on camp. But when camp gets here, you won't get to go because you got a stupid job. Amen? Hey, if I was going to get me a job, I'd tell my manager, say, hey, you mark that week down right there, buddy. I ain't going to be here. Amen. You know why? Because right, when you get on fire for God, that's when the devil comes. Yes. He knows you ain't going to go out and shoot up some dope, so he gets you out a little at a time. And he's just stealing the Word out of your heart. Stealing the Word out of your heart. You know what young people's problem is? You get jealous of each other. I know what's going to happen in this youth group. 
You say, how do you know? Because it happened in the youth group that I was in when I got saved at Nebo Baptist. And it happened in every other bunch we've ever seen here. It always happens. You have a bunch of teenagers come in. They get on fire for God. They, they love the Lord. They are so excited. And they are like a time bomb. They want to do something so bad they can't stand it. And they could turn McDowell High School upside down for the glory of God. But right before that happens, one of them breaks up with her boyfriend and the other one gets that boyfriend. And the other one gets that girl in, and then them two girls won't speak to each other. And you see what the devil's doing? He's tricking you. He's killing the spirit by your trivial problems that you have in the flesh. And the devil knows how to do that. Now let's say, let's say tonight that uh, me and Brother Bruce, neither one was married, and we both had the same girlfriend. And I'm the pastor, and he's the associate pastor. All right? And let's say, let's say uh, he, uh, I broke up with my girlfriend. He started uh, dating my ex-girlfriend or whatever. It would be very easy for me to say, I can't stand him. I'm going to fire him. <laughs> I just start looking for something he done wrong get rid of it. See, if I'm an immature Christian. But if I'm where I ought to be, I'm going to say, hey, hey, now wait a minute here, Danny. Wait just a second now. You know what this is, don't you? It's the devil trying to mess your fellowship up because look at that 260 people on them buses over there. And look how good Brother Bruce does his job. And look what God's doing here in our church. Now just hold yourself here. Don't let the devil get in here. That's what a mature Christian's supposed to do. Do you know what you teenagers will do? You say, well, I'll tell you one thing. I just think one girl. And then you don't want to speak to that girl no more. Then when they have a teenage prayer meeting at high school, you don't want to go because you don't like one of them that goes there. You don't realize that there's something much bigger here than just your little likes or your dislikes. There is the work of God Almighty and the devil is trying to stop it. Hey man, I'm already getting so excited about that youth rally coming up, I can't hardly stand it. I can't hardly stand it, buddy. That's the most exciting time of the whole year for me. You know why? The potential, the potential to reach kids from over nearly 80 or 90 or 100 churches and 15 or 16 states and get on fire for God right here. That's when the devil will come, though, and try to bust it up. You young preachers, will, you'll, you'll get jealous when one gets an opportunity to preach and the other don't get an opportunity to preach. I know. I've been through that stuff. You know what you ought to do? If your attitude's right, you ought to say, well, praise God, brother so-and-so got a door open. Hey, Amen. I'll be praying for you, brother. But it's easy to get in the flesh. It's easy. Then cometh the devil when that word is sown. You know what else you'll do? You know what else you young people's problem will do? When you get to that stage where you're all trying to, you're trying to straighten each other out. And you're rebuking each other. That's a dangerous... Don't, don't let the devil get you like that. You live your life, have your convictions, do right, serve God, and if somebody else don't live up to all your beliefs, let God work on them like He did you. Amen. See, when you first come in here, I didn't meet you at the door and say, hey, get that earring out of your ear. Get that haircut. I just got up here and preached, and I let God do all that, right? But see, what you do, you get real self-righteous, and you start saying, well, hey, now I see it. Why can't you see it? <laughs> and they ain't going to see it until you've seen it. God's got to show people stuff like that. God has to do it. If you're not real careful, you'll let the devil get Then the devil. Then comes the devil. I've been through this with so many youth groups. I am tell you, man, I'm, it's, I'm prophesying. It'll happen. It always does. It always does. Well, I ain't running around with them. They think they're better than we are. The truth is now, we're all sinners saved by grace. Some may be a little a little further down the road spiritually, but but you stick together because you're brothers and sisters. And if you disagree on something, remember there's a whole town full of teenagers that need God that when the weather gets warm, snakes start crawling. And he'll get in you in a way that you wouldn't. I'll tell you something else. Old people get jealous of young people. I've seen that happen so many times because they think the preacher pays too much attention to the young people. And the devil starts working. Well, he just cares about them, you know. I won't tell you me. I'm telling you the truth. You know who I'm with? I'm with whoever's on fire for God. I don't care if you're 89. I don't care if you're 8 or 9, brother. I just, anybody that's on fire for God, that's who I want to hang around. You want to hang around me? Get right with God. Get more right with God than I am. I'll hang around you. You can help me out. 
Then cometh the devil. That's when he comes. You say, well, you say, well, so well, listen, somebody comes in church and they ain't been coming a few weeks, they don't know nothing. They're the baby. They're like a little bitty tiny baby. You can't take a little baby and cram a piece of steak down its throat. You can't do it. it can't, it'll choke to death. They don't know nothing. I didn't know nothing about the Bible when I first got saved. And my friends back here tonight that just been saved a few days, well, they don't know nothing only about the Bible. It's, it takes a while. Like that little boy said, come to his teacher and said, the shepherds really wear socks. And the teacher said, what are you talking about? It's Christmas. He said, well, the Bible said they wash their socks by night. <laughs> That's what they do. One fellow said he thought Job was the best doctor in the world because he had the most patience. But you, that's why young people, that when the seed is sown, that's when the devil will come. Thirdly, thirdly, let me show you something else. You know when, you know when the snakes start crawling? When you really win a great victory in your life. When you really win a real victory. Born on the mountaintop! Woo! We had more on a bus than we've ever had! Glory to God! Look out! You better look out. Well, when you hit that mountaintop and you say, praise God, the Lord has answered my prayers. Woo! Amen! Thank God! You just might as well expect that there's always a valley on the other side of that hill. I, now listen, used to, I couldn't stand the thought. I thought you could stay on the mountaintop all the time. I used to think, glory to God, once you get there, you got it made and you can stay there. But I found out in the Christian life, it's just a long series of mountains and valleys and mountains and valleys and mountains and valleys. Sometimes you're on shouting ground. Sometimes you want to cry. Sometimes you feel like preaching. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes you feel like singing and shouting. Sometimes you don't. I didn't feel like preaching and I feel like it now, but I didn't want to go when I started. It. I mean, I really feel like it now. I'm, I'm wired up ready now. I'll tell you what, brother. Listen, you, you can't go by your feelings. You just go by what's right and what God said. And brother, you watch God. Listen, the Bible said, resist the devil, he'll flee from you. You know how the Lord got rid of him? Quoted that scripture. He didn't try to argue with the devil. He just pulled out three verses out of the book of Deuteronomy and sent him on down his way. The devil will come to him and the Lord got the victory. Let me show you when the Lord will come, uh, the devil will come to you and try to, the snakes start crawling. Genesis chapter 9. Turn over there to Genesis chapter 9. After the greatest victory you ever have in your life, do you think, I'll never forget the first revival I ever preached by myself. I'd preached a few meetings uh, a couple of nights in a youth revival, but I'd never preached the whole revival. So I got to preach over in, uh, near Hendersonville, and I preached that week, and I'm telling you, my throat went out. I screamed and hollered. I worried all day long what I was going to preach on. I like drove myself crazy. I mean, I, I thought I was going to lose my mind. I was, it was so hard. It was 10,000 times harder than I thought it was going to be. And I preached everything I know. And I, I found myself before that week was over saying, man, I can't wait till this is over. I'm about to die. I mean, it felt like my brain was being fried. I thought I'd, and people want me to preach, and I don't know nothing to preach. And I thought you just got down and opened your Bible, and the Lord just, you know, give it to you just like that, and it wasn't happening. He wasn't giving me nothing. And I preached everything I know and a bunch of stuff that I wasn't sure of, and some things I know probably wasn't right. And, uh, and, uh, and, and you know what? Beat it all, beat it all. It went so good, the preacher got up and said, praise God, let's go on another week. He did. Went two weeks. I said, oh, what am I going to preach for another week? And buddy, I did that and I did that. And I come home from that thing, backslid as a devil. You wouldn't think that, would you? I couldn't even, I couldn't even stay right with God for worrying about that revival. That was the greatest thing that ever happened to me at that time. Let me show you something. Genesis chapter 9. Greatest thing that happened in this world at this time was the flood of Noah, that great universal flood. You say, well, I was taught one time that it was just a local flood. Well, you shouldn't listen to people that dumb. It, 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 the, Lord said, the Lord said, I'll never do this again. Didn't he? Well, has there been any more local floods? Okay. He said, Whatever that was, he said he'd never do it again. <laughs> Wasn't no local flood, universal flood. And the Lord uh, had blessed old Noah here. Shem, Ham, and Japheth got out of the ark. The waters finally went down. The animals went out and started multiplying and replenishing the earth again. 
and I'll be. You would think that Noah would never sin again, wouldn't you? You would think, boy, after he got out of that ark and seen God drown the wicked and him and his family going to populate the whole world, man, that guy will never do nothing wrong. And I want you to look. Verse 20. Noah said, and our Bible said in Genesis 9, 20, and Noah began to be a husbandman and he planted a vineyard and he drank of the wine and was drunken and he was uncovered within his tent. The man went and got drunk that built the ark and found grace in the eyes of the Lord and went through the greatest miracle the world had ever seen and won the greatest victory anybody had ever won at that time and soon it was over, he got him some hooch and let it, let it ferment it and drunk it. Did you know that? He sure did, man. You think that could never happen? And you, hey, you know what's going to happen, you young people? You'll go back and say, praise God, hallelujah, I'm right with God now. Bye, that's when you're going to hit your face. Yeah. He's like that guy who went over Niagara Falls in a barrel, and boy, he, was, he thought, hey, he'd done it so carefully and done it and made it, and was bragging about it, walked down the street and slipped on a banana peel and fell like a broke his neck. That's what Noah did. He seen the animals walk in. He's seen the fog waters come. He's seen the water go down. He's seen the dog go out and come back. And then brother, and then went out and got drunk. When the weather got warm, them snakes started crawling. Here he is out here. What made him do that? You say, well, there was changes in the atmosphere and things happened. After. Yeah, I know that. I know that. We're going to get into that pretty soon. Well, there was changes in the atmosphere and things happened. After. Yeah, I know that. I know that. We're going to get into that pretty soon. And there was changes in the atmosphere. Maybe it wasn't ferment for the flood. I don't know. But one thing about it, he done something wrong. After the greatest victory in his life. Some people have been in great services just like that. Some been through great trials and stood. And then right after that, fell for something little. I remember when we we're working at the camp meeting down there at Nebo. We was planning a big night like we are here next Sunday. I didn't been saved just a few months. Let me tell you something, young people. They, tell, they got up and told us, they said, Get all the money you can to come Friday night. Brother Ed was down there that was going to show that film. It put them entire what will horses do? The Nebo camp meeting. Was anybody here down there on that Friday night? Was anybody here down there? I'm the only one that was there that night. I tell you what, there's one. Did you know something? Us kids went to work, just like you kids got a chance to this week. We went to work. We got the phone book down and started calling people. Go through the A's. Go through the B's. We got all our friends. We made phone calls. Man, we were so excited. We, it was wonderful. It was one That night they packed that place out. You couldn't get another person under that tabernacle. They were standing on the outside, out there in the grass, sitting on the cars. I remember I was standing up in the choir that night. And I was standing up there and I'd been saved, let's see, April, May, June, July. I'd been saved three months. And I got up there that night and boy, wait, wait, I looked out across that crowd. It got in my blood then, brother. It got in my blood. I, I wanted to see God do something. I wanted to see God do something big. And you know something? That, I guess there's maybe 300 people there that night. So back then, buddy, that was, I don't know, there may have been 400, maybe more. That was a, it was unbelievable. And I, I got up there in the choir that night and they started singing Victory in Jesus. And I started saying, I heard an old, old story. How a Savior came from... I looked out across that crowd and it was just like, I just went out of it for a little while and floated off over here somewhere. Just me and God. Boy, I about started crying and shouting. I said, thank God I heard that old story. Hallelujah! There's victory in Jesus. He, he saved me. He, he sought me. And He bought me with His redeeming blood. He owned me ere I knew Him. And all my love is due Him. He pawns me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Boy, we had the office time ever was. You know, right after that, not too long after that, I saw the snakes start crawling. Snakes started crawling. Got in some of our youth group. We used to have a group called RCA. It's dangerous leaving a bunch of teenagers around by themselves all the time. That's why the snakes will really get in them being careful. That's why you need an adult with you. Somebody knows what you're doing. And we used to go around and we'd always wind up getting in a fuss with each other and, and somebody getting in an argument. We had a group called RCA, Rejoicing Christians in Action. That's what somebody named it. And we'd take, I'd take my guitar and one of them other boys take a guitar and we'd get up in somewhere and sing in church. And I mean, the Lord had blessed. God was moving. And I saw them starting to fussing over doctrine. 
And I saw him start fussing over convictions. And I saw him start... And at the time, he thought, Bless God, I'm right and they're wrong. And we didn't realize that it wasn't nothing in the world but that old devil trying to get in there. Somebody was right and somebody was wrong. We thought both wrong most of the time. But I know one thing, the snake started crawling. It's like you're finally married. You try to keep yourself pure. You dated. You done right while you were dating. Kept yourself clean. And finally you get married and you think, the long battle is over. I can finally re- relax and enjoy life. I'm married and have Then the devil comes. Yeah, that's right. You ever notice Chase, how some people, how good they get along before they get married? And as soon as they get married, oh, you know what breaks loose? <laughs> you think you got it made now, you're married. That's what you think, buddy. He's going to turn his guns on you now like you never thought about before. You say, well, I just won't get married. He's going to turn them on you there, too. You ain't going to get through this life without the devil fighting you if you're trying to do right. Now, going out there and do wrong, people say, well, Brother Danny, why do we always have so many problems in our church? Because them snakes, man. I can tell you some churches that ain't had a dissenting word in years. Neither have they had an amen or a soul saved. It's dead cold winter. But if somebody went in there and started a fire and God started moving, them snakes start coming out of them sticks. They sure would. They sure would. You make up your mind to be a soul winner. You get under conviction. You're going to get in a bus ministry. And you do real good for about a week or two. Then cometh the devil. Ain't that the way it goes? Right in the middle of your witnessing. You think some crazy, weird thought out of nowhere, the phone will ring, company will come when the weather gets warm. I was witnessing this girl the other day. She was, I witnessed more Catholics in the last two days than I will here in a year, two years. This girl run the motel. Her name was Michelle. I seen her little, she looked like some kind of little, I don't know what she was. She wasn't the same thing as me. She looked, looked, you know, real black hair and real dark eyes and everything. And, uh, like some Italian or something like that. And I seen her name on there. It was Michelle. And I started talking to her and I, because my ride was late. I was standing there waiting on them to come pick me up. You couldn't go outside, buddy. I mean, it was like the blizzard last year. That's how it felt outside. The chill factor is so low and everything. So I was standing there waiting on her and I thought, well, maybe the Lord wants me to witness her. And I said, can I ask you a very important question? She said, yeah. I said, are you a Christian? She said, I'm Catholic. And I said, well, a Catholic can become a Christian. She said, what? And I, see, they think Catholic and Christian are synonymous. And I said, well, uh, now listen, let me tell you. The way you become a Christian, and I use the illustration about the door, and Jesus said, I'm the door, you know, and all this. And she wanted to know the difference between what I believe and what she believed. And I said, the Bible says, call no man on earth your father. Jesus said, call no man on earth your father. In a religious context, Matthew 23. She said, it does? She didn't even know that. Been to college. You know what she told me? She said... I'm open to all religions right now. And I said, when I listen, Michelle, one of them ain't, something ain't right. If they both say two different things, two religions, two books that contradict each other can't both be right, friend. That's what some of these groups say. Well, we have this book and we believe it. We have the Bible and we believe it. And they're both right. They can't both be right because they say two different things. And I said, I said, your church says one thing, the Bible says another thing, somebody am wrong. But we're just all striving to get to the same place and ever, there's a little truth in all. No! No, that ain't right. There's one way right and all the rest of them wrong. You say, I don't believe that. Uh, tell Noah that. Noah was right and everybody else was wrong. Everybody else in the whole world was wrong. But Noah, God had one plan, one way, one ark, and one door in that ark. And you didn't go in that door, you got drowned, man. I don't care what you believed. I don't care how sincere you were or how devout you were to your faith. And she said, she said, well, I, when I went to college, I was real dedicated to my faith and everything. But she said, at college, I began to open myself up to other religions. And I thought, well, maybe I don't really know right now. And I said, oh, you mean you've lost your faith at college? She said, uh, yeah. I said, they educated you out of your faith. They talked you right out of it. And see, what that poor girl's problem is, she's never had the real thing. 
and she had something that she believed in her life. Then she went and she heard about all these other religions. And that's what gets people in false religion. They don't know the real thing. If they ever knew the real thing, they'd know that other stuff ain't no good. It's faith. And I, I said, now listen, now let me explain to you. I started really getting out. The Lord started to move in there and the phone rang. A snake come out of that heat. And you know, it, I, it just broke the whole conversation. And she heard her say, um, Well, it's Leah in Rochester. No, she said, Well, it's Leah in Rochester. Something like that. I can't say it like her. But it's Yankee accent, big time. She said, she said, uh, Well, it's Leah in, in Rochester. I'm sorry, you had the wrong number. And hung up. And that broke one. Some nuthead got a viper on his hand out there somewhere. <laughs> and dialed that motel room right in the middle of my witness. That happens all the time. That happens all the time. When the Lord starts moving in, you watch them snakes start moving. Right when it got, the other Friday, last Friday night, I, I prayed all, or part of the evening, tried to get ready for a big part of the evening, and I prayed the last part of the evening, and I begged God to move in the service. I begged Him. I said, Lord, please, there's going to be a big crowd here tonight. A bunch of wild young people coming in there. And sure enough, as soon as I got up to preach, I could tell it, the Lord is all over that place. I mean, it was just... Before I got halfway through preaching, there was teenagers crying, wiping tears like that. And I was talking about how the devil's out to get them, you know, and stuff like that. And you know something? Right when I got down the run, I was going to give the invitation. They started getting restless and squirmy, and two or three... One got up and walked out, and then another one got up and walked out, going to the bathroom, then another... And it just tore that whole thing out right at the invitation. God got in there so real! Them snakes started... To crawling out of that heat. You watch. You watch. When God really starts moving in the service, you watch. There'll be some young people jump up and walk out. Every time. Every time. Kids, there's something weird about you if right when people start shouting and the service starts getting good, you suddenly have an urge to go out the door. There's something weird. I, I, there's something wrong in your heart somewhere. There's something wrong. Instead of just laying back and giving up, keep fighting. Keep fighting. Closing tonight, I want to say two things quickly. Number one, the enemy here was not Paul. They looked at him and they said, Oh, he must be a murderer. He must be a wicked man. He knows. No, the enemy was not Paul. The enemy was that venomous beast. See, the devil was the enemy. Now, you know what the, you know what the devil tries to get us to do? He gets you to think that person sitting beside you is the bad guy. That person over here sits on this side of the church that you don't like. Oh, Lord, I just can't stand him. I just don't like her and all that. Let me tell you something. We're just all brothers and sisters. The enemy is the devil, folks. We have one common enemy. It's the devil. Not each other. Your enemy ain't your husband. It's the devil. Your enemy ain't your wife. It's the devil. And then the second thing, and I'll be through. Notice this. Some of you may be scared to get on fire for the Lord because you think, man, if I do, the, the, the devil will hit me like he has you, Brother Danny, and I'll have to, I don't, I'm don't. i afraid I can't go through things that you... I've had people tell me that. They say, I'm afraid I couldn't handle what you went through and all that. Well, just look here. Look here what happened to Paul. Look here what happened to Paul. He shook it off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. That means if you're right with God, the devil might attack you, but you can throw him right in the fire, brother, and God will see to it that it don't hurt you. You can come through it. It might have hurt when he latched on to him there. I don't know. He shook it off <laughs> pretty quick. <laughs> so it might have hurt then. And I got to think about that. What would be the spiritual application of that? The fire represented that power of God and everything that run that snake out of there, and he threw it right in the fire. That means this. If you're serving God, listen, listen. I believe this is what the Lord gave me on this, on this message. If you're serving God and you're on fire for the Lord and the devil attacks you, do not quit. Don't quit that bus route. Don't quit that Sunday school class. Don't quit preaching. For heaven's sake, take that problem, cast it into fire, shout, sing, praise God, preach and everything, and the fire will burn that problem up. And you'll keep on going for God. You'll keep on going for God. Don't say, ah, venomous beast! I ain't hanging around you people no more! He could have killed him. He throwed that thing right back where it come from, brother. 
right back in the fire. Listen, listen. Stay on fire for God. Keep preaching. You say, well, Brother Dan, yeah, people told me before, they said, ain't you afraid the devil will kill you? No, the devil can't kill me until God let him. I'd all not be more scared to go serve the devil than God would kill me. <laughs> That's right. Amen? Don't fear God when you fear the devil. People say, well, if I'm afraid I really get on fire for God, they ain't no telling what the devil might do. Yeah, and if you don't, they ain't no telling what God might do. You're a whole lot safer serving God and doing right. And when you have a problem, throw him in the fire and say, I'm going to shout anyway. I'm going to preach anyway. I'm going to say amen anyway. I'm going to say hallelujah anyway. And you'll feel no harm. And they changed their mind and said, he ain't the enemy. He's a God. And he went on down there and healed that fellow's mother or wife or somebody down there in them next verses. You got marriage problems? Tell you what to do with them. Throw them in that fire. When people start shouting like Miss Oprah did a while ago, just throw your hands up and shout with her. Amen? That's right. You say, I ain't got nothing to shout about. <laughs> you ought to be ashamed of yourself. You, you're going to heaven, ain't you? You're going to walk on gold streets. I mean, you're not going to hell. I mean, you're sitting here. They ain't none of you look like you're underweight. I mean, you're 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 doing good compared to the the world standard. You're rich compared to most people. In this.